Coming up on this week's show... I speak to Syrian filmmaker Wad Al-Khatib, director of the Academy Award-nominated film For Sama. And I catch up with YouTuber Blake Calhoun to talk about the state of mobile filmmaking and get helpful hints on how to shoot at night on your mobile phone. All that and more on this week's Mobile Creator Podcast. Our first guest on this week's podcast is a Syrian filmmaker who spent five years documenting daily life under siege in Aleppo. She lived in a makeshift hospital set up by her husband, Dr. Hamza Al-Khatib. Many of the stories that she filmed in Aleppo appeared on Channel 4 News and were subsequently curated into a microsite, InsideAleppo.com. Three years after being forced to leave Syria, she started work on a film about her experience in Aleppo. The film, For Sama, named after her eldest daughter, went on to win numerous prestigious awards and even achieved an Oscar nomination. Please welcome Wad Al-Khatib. Wad, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast this week. Can I begin by taking you back to the very, very, very beginning of the Syrian revolution and to life in Aleppo when you were a student back in 2011? Yeah. Uh, hi, Glenn. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very glad to be part in this great podcast. And yeah, when I was like uh, almost nine years ago, when I was student at Aleppo University, uh, I didn't know really like what I was like doing or what the future will hold for me and for uh, all the people who I know at that time. I just knew that I was student at uh, Aleppo University doing economics. I wanted to be a journalist before when I was like 15, but that like dream just like vanished uh, because I know that the, at, in, in, inside Syria, it's very difficult to be a journalist. And with the uh, military uh, state that we have, everything was re- uh, controlled by the regime and we couldn't really like express any freedom or any feeling in, in any like sector in Syria. So when the Syrian revolution started and I joined the protest, I started to film by my mobile phone. As so many other activists in Syria, we felt at that time that this is the only thing we can do to save the story, to save what's happening, to save what was really like happening while the regime was denying everything. And over the period, I mean, you you documented daily life over a period of, of five or nearly six years, I think, wasn't that right? I mean... Yeah. Some of some of the footage, I, I remember seeing the very, very early edit that you've just completed, and I was dumbstruck. I, I literally was speechless for nearly an hour after watching it because it just it um it resonates on such a deeply emotional level. Um can I just ask you to talk me through the, the routine, the daily life routine? Like for instance, when you were in the hospital with Hamza, like what, what was the daily routine like? What what was life like? I mean, like really when we were there, we didn't expect that this is will be like kind of routine you know we were living every day that this is like maybe kind of the last day or something we we don't know what will happen next uh like the shelling and the bombing was coming to every area in Aleppo. there was no safe place uh there was no like even uh, like a shelter or a place where you can say like okay i'm i'm now here and i'm safe and at the same time when you took the decision of being part of the revolution in Syria, where you took that decision that I want to go out to the street and uh, like being part of this protest, you know that you are risking yourselves in very high risk. And being part of uh, like people who stood against the regime, you know that the regime will stop at nothing to crush us, to uh, like destroy all the community. And for this, the shelling and the bombing was really attacking every area in Aleppo. Uh, but we had so much hope that what we are doing is the right thing. And if we didn't, if we stop now, you know, like what next, what will happen? There is no return in this journey and you need just like to keep going. So every one of us were like, we were just trying to find our way of living, our uh, like thoughts about how we can like continue our work and find that hope every day. For me, filming was that, uh, like things which give me resilience and give me reason of being in that situation. For Hamza, maybe like because he was a doctor, for Afra and Salim and so many people in the film, like there was something to do in that community to be part of this 
uh, like people who decided to stand and like just order and request their their uh, uh, rights. Uh, there are scenes in the film that that you know really are emotionally harrowing is the only way I can describe it. Like very very difficult to watch. Um, that must have been amplified a thousandfold by you being present. And there's a very poignant scene in Forsama where you talk about witnessing something in the surgery and, and getting really emotional, how Hamza gets really annoyed at you and asks you to leave because he doesn't want anyone crying, basically. and You have to stay professional about it all. That must have been an occasion that repeated multiple times with, with the, you know, with the level of human suffering that you witnessed. How did you how did you stay so focused? I mean, you know, you at the time were not a professionally trained filmmaker and yet you still documented what really were, you know, incredibly difficult circumstances and yet you kept going and you recorded hundreds upon hundreds of hours. How, how did you keep that resilience going? You know, like you have no option of not being like, like this. If you couldn't stand in this way, you just like you leave. That the least things you can do. I mean, if you are in that situation and that's, yeah, could happen again and again so many times when you collapse behind the camera or when you can't like really see what you are even like film. But the only thing that, you know, like I'm here for this moment, I could be killed after a second. I could be like killed after a minute and I just need to do my work before I will like be one of these people who are like dying. Uh, there is no other way of surviving the situation the importance that I like really believe in uh, of any picture I got, of any sound I got, of any video, it's more than uh, like my whole life. I know that I'm, ris I'm risking my myself every second, but I know that also like this worth it. Every people who we lost, every uh, child who, who I found or he, who I saw in my own eyes while they were dying, you know, like, filming and keep filming this is the only way for me to keep going um when when you look back now you're in the uk but you've you've been on the road for a two-year whirlwind tour is the only way i can describe it i've i've followed your your journey and you've been all over the world at, at festivals and showing the feature film what would you say has been the highlight like the highest point of that whole journey since the since the movie was released uh, it's a really hard question and <laughs> I don't know really, but I mean like every event and every festival and even I've been in the, uh, the Mojo uh, last year uh, film festival, which you, you had and it's just like really every place and every uh, like people we met, every people who still like uh, every place we can be able, we are able to like give uh, people understanding more about Syria, about the situation, about that this is still happening, that will be like a very important place. Um, I really, all of them for me kind of equals. Um, maybe I can like just highlight the BAFTA when we won and we, I was able to get on, to, uh, on the stage, talk in front of like thousands and millions of people who are watching at home, uh, hundreds of influencers who they were inside the BAFTA theater. Um, like for me, one of, one of, this is one of the moments, but also other moments when I got like message from people who live until today under the regime control, telling me that what we've done in the Syrian revolution is something they are proud of. And they like all everything we've done, everything the Syrian people they've done, it will never be for nothing. You know, like message like this, I feel like it does. I don't know when how and why these people watch the film and how, but it's for me very important. Do you feel um, now that the the Oscar nomination and everything, which to a certain extent from a from I guess from a notoriety or, or publicity point of view was was a huge achievement, do you feel now that there's a new phase to the whole story? I mean, you set up um, uh, for Sama, help for Sama. What what's the new website that you've created? Action for Sama, the impact. Action campaign. for Sama. What's the what's the idea? What are you hoping to achieve with that now? So, like, to be very honest, while we were working on the film, I've never thought that the film will be, like, even seen by so many people. Uh, maybe from my experience at the news and when I was working at Channel 4 News, I saw how many people watch all my reports, but no one really did anything 
or like in general, the situation in Syria stayed like very bad. And from that experience, I thought that I'm doing maybe the film just for me to protect my story and to save this for our people. But then when uh, we start seeing, showing the film all over the world, and I saw how many people came to us asking us like, what can we do? Uh, starting from the public, from very normal people who really like can change anything in the uh, policy of their countries, but also like from people who are decision makers, MPs, uh, Congress uh, men and women, and people who are really like be able to change something. They were just like asking us, what can we do? And for this, we uh, set up this impact campaign, Action for Sama, which we tried just like to help people to know more about Syria, to understand behind the scenes, to understand the narrative that uh, journalists and media, are, how they like deal with the with the serious situation, and also to provide the public some simple tools where they can be like influencers into the serious situation. If they can like write to their MP or sign this petition, or even the least thing like to stay in solidarity with the people who still enter today inside Syria. Because the main feeling that I had since I left that we were let down by the whole world. And when I was out and when I showed the film, I saw how many people like they were literally crying, telling me like, we sorry, we, we didn't know what was happening. And I felt this is like just part of the responsibility to make the people who still until today in Idlib feeling and going through the same experience I had when I was in Aleppo and even worse in some places, like they should know that people outside are not okay with what's happening. That's um, really, really important. I, I, I can I can share that sense of helplessness though. I, I felt it very, very strongly having watched the film um, one, realizing the importance of it because you were shining light on what otherwise was a media blackout and there was so much disinformation and deliberate lobbying, partly by Russia, to be fair, in uh, supporting Assad's regime. Yeah. Um, you you have, I read somewhere that you've donated uh, all of your source footage. Is that correct towards a, is it a war crimes tribunal? Do you want to talk a little bit about that to me? Yeah, I mean, for me, like the import, the importance of the film is not just to make people understand what's happening, but how we can be like, like uh, moving forward in the importance of these images and these videos. And because the film is not just a film for me, it's my life, it's my whole journey. I was like from be the beginning looking for where we can use this footage. And for that, we submitted all the archive related to attacking hospitals to the Triple IAM which is mechanism under the UN umbrella to collect all the evidence about the war crimes that happened in Syria and in any other places. And also we are working with Guernica 37, which is um, like with the, uh, the lawyer Toby Kidman, uh, building a case, a, a case against uh, attacking hospital using the, uh, the attack that was very clear in the film. Uh, using the CCTV and all the other footage that we have around that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, do you mind me asking, I, I remember seeing a post that Hamza actually shared on his Instagram account where I think it was a photograph of a bullet and someone commenting as in this is for you or something to that effect, like he brushed it off. I, but I'm wondering, do you feel secure now or do you still feel under threat? Because clearly the regime has really taken note of the film. It's it's uh, probably a huge embarrassment and in many ways that's that's a huge achievement. But do you fear for your safety or do you feel more secure now that you're based in the UK? Like that uh, huge attack started actually or like was very high right before the Oscar mm -hmm. nomination and we were aware like of this even before. But what we had in our mind that like it's very strange, but I mean, I hope people will understand what I really like referring to. But for me and, and Hamza, we feel that we should have been done, like we should have been killed like three years ago and everything we are doing now is additional to our life. Uh, I know it seems like very strange, but because we lived through this very, very closely and we were expecting to be dead in so many occasions. So what's happening now is not really important. What's important now is to keep this story going on, to keep the conversation about what's happening in Syria and whatever will happen, will happen. We are just trying to do our best to protect ourselves, to protect our daughters and even try sometimes to like 
uh, change the timing or the post that we are or where we are traveling, like kind of the very basic secure security information. But after, like, in addition to this, we know that the regime is able to do anything they want, even if we are now in the UK. We hope like that we will stay safe, but it's they wanted us to be silent. They wanted us to not talk about this. And that's the last thing I could really do in my life. Well, well, I mean, for anyone to have not only experienced and if you don't mind me saying endured the hardships that you've been through, but to be so self-sacrificing and to be able to take that story to the world is really, you know, phenomenal, unique and incredible achievement. I, I know the thing I get from you every time we've spoken is that this is not about a personal thing at all. This is very much about the story and making sure that people really, really understood what happened. Can I just for a moment turn to something a little lighter? So you mentioned the girls. How are they settling in in the UK? Like, I mean, I, I follow you on Instagram and I'd encourage anyone listening or watching to do the same because it's just a snapshot of just, you know, life for any family. You would really, to be fair, and this is a testimony to you as a parent, you'd have no idea what the girls have been through based on the photographs that you share like are they enjoying life in the UK yeah I mean they kind of settling down now and they speak mixed between English and Arabic we try so hard now to keep the Arabic but it's very hard and difficult especially with the nursery and the school so it's kind of like most of their time speaks in English and now with the corona it's like kind of strange situation for them and I think for every parents in this like court now but I just like uh, trying so hard you know like to keep the content between what happened with us and between Syria Aleppo and our life here uh, like trying all the time to keep the like stories or kind of the talks about where where we came from and at the same time, of course, I'm very like curious to like provide them with the life that they deserve and just like kind of ignore everything we've been through and try to focus on now on their future. I, I think as any like parents who are listening now. Sure. How, how is Hamza doing? Is he settled yeah. into the UK? Well, he's good. He's doing very well. Yes. Okay. He's working like now full time. And on, in September, he will start doing public health in London School of Hygiene. Wow. So this also will be like a new uh, thing for him. So Very good. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, look, um, I'm going to strongly encourage people if they've not yet seen For Sama to, to find out or find a way to see it because it really is a life-changing film, something you simply have to see. Um, if people want to support For Sama, is it Action For Sama they should visit now or is there anything else that they can do to yeah. help? Yeah, please. Like first really as you just like said please watch the film because whatever you listen or you heard us talking about it it's totally different experience and it's online on channel 4 so it's like very easy to to uh, to find and please join us in our impact campaign action for summer the website actionforsummer.com and we you can find us on social media like everywhere twitter instagram and facebook Okay, great. Well, I'll put the uh, social media links up basically on the video for this. Um, Wad, I know you're under pressure for time and I'm, I'm conscious that I have to let you go, but it's uh, it's an honor and it's been a real pleasure, not just talking to you today, but having shared a little bit of the journey with you over the last couple of years. You're a remarkable woman and I hugely appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Glenn. I'm very glad to know you and thanks for all the support that you've done through the years. Shukran. Shukran. <laughs> I got a chance to talk to Blake Calhoun, who runs a popular YouTube channel dedicated to mobile filmmaking. Blake specializes in gear reviews, but he's also an educator. As a filmmaker himself, he has interesting perspectives on how to capture the best images using Apple and Android phones. And with over 100,000 subscribers, it's safe to say he knows a thing or two about the mobile filmmaking world. Thank you for joining me and uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. So, hey, um, first I wanted to talk to you about, you know, what is new and exciting in the world of mobile filmmaking? Because you are a thought leader um, and an educator uh, in this space. And I just wanted to kind of get your your sense as to what is new and exciting in this in, in this uh, realm. Well, doing a podcast like this is pretty new and exciting. I've never done it quite like this being... Um, Using an app, I'm talking to my iPhone 11 right now, 11 Pro Max, right. talking to you, and I'm using a Rode uh, 
a mic that I could plug into my camera and I could also use it with mobile. And so I guess the point being here is there's all kinds of exciting things, whether it's geared towards filmmaking or live streaming, which is big right now because of the pandemic, obviously. Right. Um, technology advances so quickly, but I'm always just amazed. We're always looking ahead to the next thing, of course. Right. And so the iPhone 12, I guess, has been rumored now for a couple months and it's coming out in September ish, October. But the iPhone 11 is still the the top tier, I guess, phone right now. Right. Um, but I guess the point being is it's really just all exciting to me. It just it's moving so quickly from when I started my YouTube channel back in 2012 with the iPhone 4S, I believe, 720p. I, was, I always say I was excited back then when I found Filmic Pro and I could shoot 24p. So my how times have changed. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, to me, it's just all exciting. It's just, it's really, it's empowering. I think that's one of the coolest things. Again, I mentioned the way we're doing this podcast right now. Imagine doing something like this just a few years ago. It would be impossible. Right, right. So uh, given that, you know, the the technology has come so far so fast and is only getting better from here, um, how do you use mobile in your in your day to day workflow? The number one, the number one way that I really u- utilize mobile tech, and my main tech is iPhone right now, is B-roll, and I use it for B-roll all the time, and, and I, it'll supplement some traditional cameras for me. Now, sometimes I will use it 100%, depending on the video. There's a lot of videos on my channel where I do 100% mobile, but I also use a lot of traditional cameras. I have a Black Magic camera. I have. My main YouTube camera is a Sony a6400. And, and so I guess the point being is I don't, I don't look as at mobile as a be-all. That's not the right way to say it. As I have to be 100% mobile or 100% traditional. I am one of these guys who mixes and matches quite a bit. And if I actually was just having a conversation the other day uh, with another industry type person, and we were talking about if – if the iPhone would get to the point where it was really good in low light, then I could almost use the iPhone all the time because you can, you can use different adapters and that kind of thing to, to get shallow depth of field, which a lot of people miss shooting with mobile. Again, right. I'm looking more towards the, the filmmaking side. And that is my perspective, by the way, for those that don't know. I mean, you know, mobile is great for journalism or for you know, social media, my, my, the way I like to look at it is more from a filmmaking perspective. And so low light is really important and we're just not there yet. And so the point being is I like to supplement my bigger cameras with mobile. I would say that's probably the way my daily process involves mobile. Right, right. Um, that was a long-winded answer. Sorry, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is all good. I mean, you know, the the great thing is that you, you know, because you you know, you are a filmmaker, you know, um mm-hmm. at first, um but you're also an educator, you know, you have a, a unique perspective, which is why one of the reasons why I'm so excited to talk to, to talk about you uh, to talk to you um about this is because, you know, I I was a fan first of your uh, of your uh, YouTube channel. Um, I as long as I've been in the business, which is, you know, about 30 years now, um, you know, I still, you know, reach to you know people like you on YouTube to find out, you know, different tricks and, and techniques. And, um, uh, you know, you know, uh, we, we talked before that I'm going to be making a, uh, another feature film. It, it'll mm-hmm. be my second feature film on mobile would be my fourth feature film, but my, my second one using mostly mobile. Um, but you know, I, there's always something to learn and, you know, low light is a big deal. Um, and especially because I'm going to be making a horror movie that is going to take place, you know, like two thirds at night. Um, hmm. so it's, it's going to be, tricky. It, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, you know, there, there's, it's, it's uh, baptism by fire is, is, uh, is, is what it is. So that the first it can be done, it's just yeah. not quite as easy, of course, as using right. traditional in low light. I mean, especially right. Right. So is, are, are there um, any tricks that you can, you know, bestow upon me <laughs> as a <laughs> as a lowly filmmaker, uh, you know, about uh, shooting in, in, you know, low light? The number one, the number one thing, and you 
if you watch my channel or if you follow Richard Lackey at all, um, it is don't let your ISO go above 100. And I, mean, I preach that, but every time someone tells me about how terrible their footage looks in low light, myself included here, by the way, I, I will, will investigate. And it's because their ISO is like 500 or 800 or whatever. It's crazy. 800 ISO on a traditional camera is fine. On the, on the iPhone, the native ISO, which is, you know, zero gain is 22 or 20. It's, I think it's 22. Mm -hmm. And so you want to keep your ISO under 100. If you can do that, I find that you can get pretty good results. And, especially if you always have something in your shot that is not, that has a little bit of contrast. In other words, if you're following someone through a hallway perhaps, and as long as there's something, a little bit of light hitting their face, or if you're trying to shoot in pitch the dark or just very, very dark environment with no contrast at all, no, even like moonlight or something, you, you I don't, you don't get the best results. At least not in my experience. So the the main thing is to uh, is to have your characters or whatever you need uh, to to focus on kind of in a pool of light somewhere. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, like I did a music video that I haven't released yet. I shot it several months ago, right before the pandemic started, and I, I used the new the the B script one point five five times anamorphic, which um, I was testing out for those guys. And right. I think you and I talked about that uh, recently. That right. um that that lens. I shot a music video and I did it with more or less one light. And it was, I was really worried about doing it that way. So I did very dr dramatic side lighting, almost Rembrandt kind of lighting. Right. To where one side of the face just completely drops off. And by keeping my eyes, keeping my ISO low and by making sure that there was some contrast, as you say, a pool of light in the scene, I was really surprised at how good it turned out. Now, if you go examine the footage under a microscope and lift up the blacks, it's full of noise. Right, okay. Right. But when it is, when it is actually, when you're looking at it playing back or once it's color graded, <clears throat> excuse me, once it's color graded, it looks, per I'm, I was really impressed. It was one of the, one of the first things I had shot in a long time that was low light that I was really happy with. And so I guess the point to that is the newer devices, I think starting with the 10s max, it has a little bit bigger sensor, right? Just ever so slightly than the eight plus or, or the 10 and it's better. It is better in low light. Gotcha. But still keep that ISO low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's going to be the trick, right? Um, yeah. Keeping, I mean, keeping I know that's ISO. super technical and that's probably, you know, depending on who's watching this, that may bore them to tears, but it is when you're talking about mobile, it's super important. Right. Well, it's when you're talking about, you know, something other than an Alexa or a red, um, you know, even with DSLRs, you know, you have to, mm -hmm. you know, think about it in that in, in that sense as well. You know, I mean, maybe, sure. you know, other than the the Sony a7 uh, uh, series. You S2, know, cause, yeah, yeah, because those are low light beasts, you know, we're, we're not are. there with with mobile yet. No. Um, no, but but you know what, I mean, as we've talked about before, you know, uh, the, the technology is only going to get better from here. Right. And so with the combination of the sensors getting, you know, eking up just a little bit, you know, uh, bigger and bigger every time, and mm -hmm. computational uh, photography and videography, um, you know, things, it, it won't be long before you're going to have a low light beast that can actually fit in your pocket that you can use as a phone. Um, I think so. I hope so. But I really do believe that. Now, in terms of um, editing, um, I know, you know, that, that you use a computer for your for your editing. Do you use, um, uh, you know, which I'm a big fan of um, uh, LumaFusion. Uh, do you happen to use LumaFusion in your workflow? And, uh, and if so, how has that worked out for you? I've been editing for 20 plus years. I started on Avid and I went to Final Cut Pro and then I went to Premiere Pro and that's kind of where I am now. And I still use mainly Premiere Pro and I, I dabble in Final Cut Pro 10 some and then I dabble in DaVinci Resolve as well. I mainly use Resolve for color correction. But to answer your question, yes, I use LumaFusion and I've started to use it a lot more recently because I got an iPad Pro uh, 2020 version. That's the 12.9 inch. It's beautiful, isn't that it? That made a big difference because what's that? It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And I just got the Magic Keyboard. And as a matter of fact, the YouTube video I'm working on right now is going gonna, is gonna to showcase some of that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is the my iPad before, it was an Air 2, iPad Air 2, which was a good machine. I still have it. 
it's just it was 9.7 inch i think it just even with that it it just wasn't as fun to edit on it it felt a little bit like work and then working i mean my iphone 11 works a lot better truth truth be told compared to that right right but i like i really like lumafusion and now that you can because again my brain works more like an old time or an old school editor I started, when I started editing, we did offline editing. And so I'm not talking about tape. I was kind of after the tape part. I'm not, I'm I'm sorry. I was, I was around for tape, but it was tape ingest, not tape to tape. Right. You know, obviously I started with on Avid ingesting beta cam or whatever. Right. (laughs) And so now that with LumaFusion, you can offline edit more or less is really cool. Right. And so I have done a couple of things where I do a rough edit in Luma and then I export an XML into Final Cut or DaVinci and that is really cool. A lot of people, I did a video about it on my YouTube channel. I guess if you're in your 20s and you have only been editing in Final Cut Pro for the last, you know, five years or whatever, you don't understand the um, how amazing that is. Because people are like, well, why wouldn't I just finish the edit in LumaFusion? It's like, you can. There's no reason not to. But you can't do After Effects in LumaFusion. I mean, or you can't do high-end compositing. Right. The idea that to, to do this... I talked at the very beginning of this interview, how it's awesome, how technology is advancing. This is one of those things. And it seems like a small thing, but to be able to now edit a rough cut on my iPad on a plane. Yeah. You could do it on a laptop forever, but on an iPad now is really cool. And then open it up, you know, on your, on your desktop or your laptop. To me, that's, that's a huge thing. And then once they, once they incorporate the frame IO and then you can do, proxy workflows and so you could actually shoot a movie on an area alexa and then have your footage in frame io and then edit that in luma i mean that really opens us up to larger productions you know so you what you just touched on what is going to be pretty much my workflow for this next movie um so i'm going to be shooting on iphone you know and maybe android um then i'm gonna take that footage you know into um into LumaFusion. i'm going to edit and i'm gonna take the sections because you know I, i'm because I'm crazy, I'm going to actually uh, put a CG character into this next, uh, in, into this movie. Um, so I'm going to take the sections that need to be treated, you know, for, for uh, CG, bring them into uh, Final Cut. Then I have this plugin that sends it over into After Effects so I can do all of my compositing and then mm-hmm. then drop that into Frame.io, which then I can just snatch that treated clip and drop it right on right back into my timeline um, in in LumaFusion. And it, it, that is that is a revelation because then it, it becomes, you know, more of an online instead of an offline, you know, situation, mm-hmm. you know, so in, in thinking about it just kind of in wrapping up, um, like, what do you, what do you want to see from, from the mobile filmmaking space? What, what, what do you, what are you excited about, you know, or what is the potential that you're excited about uh, coming up soon here? Just the, and I'm going to say incremental, but just the incremental improvements excite me. Again, I'm we're, we're kind of getting pretty technical in this podcast, and a lot, and some people may be like, "Whoa, I don't, I don't care about that. I just want to shoot good video or whatever." Right. Well, that is kind of the point of the incremental upgrades, and so a little bit of a bigger sensor would be nice. Uh, Ten bit, you know, H.265. That seems to be. It doesn't have to be pro. It will never be pro res on a phone. I just don't think they'll ever do that. Because storage capacity and just, right. but H.265, a lot of the newer, I think, like the Canon C500s and the new Sony, I, I, the name escapes me, the bigger cameras, they shoot in H.265 now and they do 10-bit. And so 10-bit video would be great. And just little things that make our life easier, and especially on the post-production side, and just improve the quality to where... You know, I mean, because as, as big of a proponent as I am of iPhone, I still, for me, on my everyday kind of work, I just, they're not quite there for me yet. They're there, as I mentioned at the beginning. I love them for B-roll. For certain projects, they're 100% there. But for what I do, I'm talking about me specifically, I just need those, I just need those incremental improvements 
and on the on the geeky stuff <laughs> um, because the you know the but the dynamic range is there i mean that right. the dynamic range is amazing right and that that's a big you know whenever people are shopping for big boy cameras alexa whatever they're always talking about dynamic range right so that's good but then you know i need better low light a little bit bigger sensor and 10 bit those kind of things and i don't think those are especially the 10 bit I don't think that's asking too much. And Apple could do that in a heartbeat. Apple could do it. I mean, Sony is doing it with their new um, Sony Xperia. I always have to remind myself that we are the the, the niche, though. In other words, True. they make these phones for the soccer moms shooting birthday parties of their kids, which is totally fine. I'm cool with all that. Yeah. But just like with the DSLRs and the mirrorless, those weren't designed originally for professional filmmakers. Right. Not at all. But they became popular because they were affordable and there was enough quality that's almost there to a cinema camera to where, you know, that next step up, is it really worth the extra 10 grand for a 2% better camera kind of thing? Right, know? right. Yeah. And and we are talking uh, at this point, we're only talking like small percentage points, you know, in, in terms yeah, of. Yeah, no, you know, without question. In, in without question. Game. Yeah. Yeah, well, great. So it's exciting. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's exciting. I think in the next couple of years, I mean, I probably said this two years ago, which was true, because the, the, from the iPhone, I had an 8 Plus to the, to the 11, to me, is a huge advance. And that was only a year and a half or so. Right. And so who knows in the next two years where we'll be, because Apple definitely puts out new phones on a yearly basis to make more money, take more money from us. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they get it every time yeah. they get it. Yep. So, yeah. Well, good deal. Hey. Blake, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, where can people uh, see the, all the great stuff that you do? Well, my main hub is my, my website, which is iPhoneographers.tv, or my YouTube channel is where you know all the magic is. <laughs> I'm just That's kidding. Uh, and no, that it is, is ma- it is magic. It is magic. Oh, thanks. Um, it's iPhoneographers on YouTube and. Uh, yeah, I'm doing weekly videos there, so I'm there all the time, and then I'm on Twitter quite a bit as well. So Great, great. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate your time, and uh, I will be talking to you again soon. Let's do this again so right. we can, you know, keep the flow Catch going. Catch up. All yeah, right. good luck with your movie, too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will be calling you about that. Okay. All right. Sounds <laughs> For good. Help. All right. Thanks, Blake. Take care. All right. Bye. <laughs> Well, Glenn, it has been a great week since we've launched, like literally a week ago, right? So uh, have you gotten any responses? Have Have you seen anything from the community that we're trying to build here? I think it's really interesting. Um, I, so I, you know, I've tried to push out on various different platforms, but of course we're, we're starting from scratch. So the website uh, has got quite a few subscribers, which I was really, really uh, delighted to see, to be fair. Um, on Twitter, I, I, <clears throat> I think I tweeted twice, probably not enough to do proper um, amplification of the message. It, well, let's call it a soft launch, shall we? Let's just go with a soft launch, okay? Uh, but, you know, look, seriously, um, there's there's a lot of balls to juggle and it's very much a learning process uh, and right now i think it's fair to say for both of us the energy has been on this part of it rather than that part of it, the post production right. part um but yeah i mean we're on instagram we're on twitter i didn't do facebook partly in protest uh, we won't go there uh but uh, and we have the website so you can listen on a whole plethora of different audio uh audio podcast platforms thank you to anchor um so yeah i mean it's out there and uh you know, I think it's it's going to take a while to, to ripple and for people to hear more about it. But we, I mean, just on Twitter the other day, I, I got a message, which was, to be fair, addressed to both of us, which is very nice, from a guy called Rob Leach. And Rob's comment was, thanks, I am CJ, CGJ and uh, Glenn for first episode of Mobile Creator Podcast. So interesting to hear what people are making with mobiles. Love the chats with Go Film It and Reno Wilson. Each project sounds really exciting. Such a great follow-up from the summit. So, I mean, you know, it's nice, and it's lovely when people interact like that, you know? That is great. That is great. I mean, that you know, we're, we're doing it for the people, which is, which is great. And anybody who's interested in making anything on mobile, that's who we're doing it for. And, and I'm glad that it's starting to catch on, and I'm glad. Thank you, Rob, for, uh, for the kind words. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, you know, the other thing is, is like, I would say this, if you're listening to us right now, please take this message away. Like, it's it's great that the two of us can bounce ideas off each other about who our guests should be. But a huge part of our vision for the podcast is, is to be able to tap into the part of the community that maybe we don't know yet. 
So if you're out there and if you're listening or if a friend of yours has tipped you off that the podcast exists, do get in contact with us. Like reach out via, you know, Twitter or what Instagram, whatever your platform is. You can email us via the website if you wish um, and tell us your story. You know, we're looking for interesting stories. We want to hear case studies of people who are pushing the boundaries in mobile content creation. And it's not just filmmaking, even though our first show was very much, you know, focused on the filmmaking side of things. We're just as equally interested in social media content, um, news, uh, documentary, like the whole plethora. If you're doing something interesting with the mobile, we want to hear about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of doing things interesting with mobile, um, our sponsors, LumaFusion and Filmic Pro, they, they are helping push the, the boundaries of what mobile can do. So, uh, and without them, we'd be nowhere with, with this, you know, so, uh, so a big thank you goes out to, to them, um, because they're, they're, you know, kind of like the heartbeat of, of what this, uh, this endeavor is, is all about. So. Yeah, I, I think you summed it up perfectly. I mean, um, when, when the original idea for the summit was being kicked around, I mean, you know, the summit went from concept to delivery in the space of about four weeks, which is pretty amazing iteration. And it really was all hands on deck. And to me, it really showed exactly how yeah. how dedicated both the, the Filmic and the LumaTouch companies are on supporting their user base. And I mean, you know, to support us with continuing this endeavor, I think, is a huge testimony to them and their support of the community at large. So if you've never heard of them, you should really <laughs> jump on Google and have a quick look. I've, I've been training on Filmic since, I think, 2013, version 1. And uh, Luma, since it basically went into the App Store, I think it was 2017 when it went from the Corel version to the full-on Luma Touch version. But it is an absolutely uh, amazing editing application. So, you know, Absolutely. Check them out. absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, all that being said, um, where do we go from here? Um, well, yeah, so we gave a, well... I might have set myself up for a fall last week by saying that I want people to come on the journey with me as a newbie filmmaker person stepping way outside my comfort zone. Um, and, and I would be looking to you for inspiration and, and kind of guidance. Um, could probably do with a lot of it this week because I've not done anything in the last seven days. I'm like, I, no, no, absolutely zilch. Now, 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 Glenn, that's a problem. Because we are supposed to push each other, and no mm-hmm. wonder. It, 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 I, I was wondering why I wasn't getting any any nudges, you know, from from you. So, look, I'm 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 gonna start coming down a little bit harder on you uh, to to kind of get your your project done. What do you think right now is your your block? Is there is there a mental block? Is there a, an actual like physical you know uh, block? You know, something that is really stopping you from moving forward, or is it what is it? I, uh, okay, so c- complete honest disclosure, okay. right? So we, as of today in Ireland, have had uh, an easing of the restrictions. Now, for the first time in uh, oh, 13 uh, weeks or whatever it is, crazy time, um, we're allowed to drive more than 10 kilometers from our house. So suddenly we have the ability to travel, but not abroad yet. So only uh, only essential travel is allowed overseas. Um, and as I mentioned last week, uh, my plan for the film was to basically potentially do it in London. I did, as you might have heard last week, talk to Cass and, and float that idea, and he was very supportive, which is great. But to be perfectly honest, I've just been really distracted over the last seven days. Like a tiny bit of that, to be fair, was, was trying to get the first podcast out, but that was, that was only sure. a tiny bit of it. The second bit of it is, is I got completely distracted by um, bushcraft. And that's a whole other discussion. It's not for this show. But uh, yeah, I've, I, I just got consumed. That sounds this. interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got nothing to do with cutting bushes. Well, very little to do with cutting bushes. But anyway, yeah. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that I'm, I'm, I've been posting a lot about that particular topic. But now that the, the crazy energy that comes with the adrenaline rush is kind of subsided and I'm, I'm kind of there now with that, I'm, I'll, I'll look back to this space and start to do some proper work. But thank you for the kick in the uh, Well, here. yes. I mean, so, you know, the, all those all those things, I, I and I certainly understand distractions, you know, that everybody's got them, uh, we, we, we do, but what also, what everybody also has is excuses. So no more excuses. Remember, we are using this time period as an excuse to have no more excuses. Remember, right. excuse That's to have right. no more excuses. So, um, so 
to that end, you know, the the things that I've been doing with my feature film, trying, trying to move things forward, and it is number one, I, I tell myself I cannot have any zero percent days. So if I get one percent, it's a win. Right. So uh, it, I, I will crack open the script and I will just write a few words, you know, and the, the script meant, as we talked about, which is, you know, is more of a more than a treatment and less than a script. So it's not all of the dialogue necessarily. So what I am doing is putting starter dialogue in for, for my actors. So I'm, I've, I've been doing that and I'm almost done with that. But I've also started doing some storyboarding and previs. So. Wow which is an essential, you know, part to doing most productions, um, not, not necessarily all, but most. Um, and in this one in particular, because it is a horror film. So, um, but one of the things that I have been doing is getting my gear together, you know, so you could also be doing that, you know, because I know you're a gearhead just as much yep. as I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, kind of, you know, to kind of touch on on what's happened is um, for those who are uh, seeing me uh, right now on the uh, YouTube channel, I'm holding up a uh, beast cage, which is a uh, it's a device that you put your phone. Uh, this one is particularly for the iPhone 11 Pro Max. Um, and you, you put your phone in it and then you can attach your 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 lenses, you can attach, you know, audio gear, different handles, you know, to be able to um, turn it into a full blown, you know, DSLR style um, uh, piece of kit. But then I also got for what's going to be the second camera is a Beast Grip Pro. And there's a bit of a, a shine on that, but a Beast Grip Pro, which is very much the same thing, except you can put any phone in this one. Um, mm -hmm. It's not specifically made for any for any particular phone. Um, I got filters, which is something that you need black, um, uh, black pro mist filters. Uh, so you can take some of the, uh, video curse off of the, uh, off of the, image so it, it softens it a bit and, you know, kind of does this halation kind of around the highlights, you know, so it, 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 it makes it all nice and soft and, and film esque. Um, and then I've got a couple of lenses, uh, which are interesting from Beast Grip as well. Um, I've got a telephoto and a wide angle lens, and uh, and then an interesting piece of kit, which I really kind of want to talk about also, is an Apple Watch. Um, and the reason why I got that is because I'm going to be using my phone. Usually, I use my phone to to check my scheduling, read parts of the script, and all of that while I'm in production. But um, but I can't do that because my phone is going to be a camera only mm -hmm. during this, during this whole thing. So well, I, I got the, the, the Apple watch so I can check on my schedule, you know, just to make sure that I'm, I'm, you know, going on schedule, uh, uh, during the shoot, but also be able to use filmic pros, uh, remote app for the second camera. So I can, I can trigger the other camera and monitor what's going on, uh, in, uh, in terms of the, the image in uh, in that other camera from the watch which i think is pretty revolutionary i had a gen 1 apple watch actually and have to be perfectly honest i've only used it for filmic remote and the heart monitor probably <laughs> more for the latter one to be perfectly honest but it is great when i'm on courses it's it's often a topic when people are talking about doing pieces to camera for news how do you make sure your framing is right if you're using the back camera as opposed to the selfie camera and that's where the filmic remote app on the watch is just such an absolute gift it is. It's. It's going to be spectacular. I haven't. Uh, I haven't opened them. The the plastic is still on them, uh, you know, but I'm going to do some unboxings for on, on my YouTube channel, and uh, and I'll I'll make sure that we link to all those things. But um, this is just kind of essential kit that I'm kind of moving forward. So the next things that I need are audio, um, and then um, some additional lighting other than the lighting that I already have. So and then I think my filmmaking kit will be done 
I think. That, that's impressive. That's impressive. It, it would be good. You know, some people are going to be listening to this show just on a podcasting platform, an audio platform, as opposed to watching the YouTube uh, channel. Will you or can you uh, either post or share a couple of photographs of the kit that you've just mentioned? So, you know, if someone is a complete newbie, hasn't even heard of Beast Grip or any of the other products you've talked about, at least there's some frame of reference for them. And as you said, we'll definitely go and send some links actually in the in the YouTube and on the website. I guess we could do that too. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I, I can, uh, I'll, I'll put together uh, some some snapshots but then maybe what I'll do is on my uh, on, on my website what I'll do is write an article about everything that I'm using and then I'll, I'll just kind of have you know a full description and how I plan to use it and all of that kind of stuff so that'd be great and we can share that then on, on all the platforms as well excellent okay uh, good stuff. Well, look, I mean, we're, we're almost out of time. Um, I think we've had two really interesting guests again this week. So that's, you know, four out of four kind of potluck so far. Um, until next week, again, if you have any ideas, guys, um, that you want to share with us, if you want to bring any stories to our attention, or if you just want to give us some feedback, all of that is very, very welcome. Remember, we're on multiple audio streaming uh, channels. You can find us on www.mobilecreatorpodcast.com. Um, and uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, hopefully you'll get to hear from us again Friday next week until then bye for now the mobile creator podcast is sponsored by filmic pro and luma touch